Okay, hello. I hope you've all finished your homework and are studied, studying for the test. If not, then stop doing homework and start doing the test. Um, if you, for those of you who don't know Ifat, you will notice that her tests, um, the style of her tests are quite repetitive. So after you've solved the four, question, the four tests from previous years, you should have a kind of idea of what's going on and you should expect something quite similar. That's usually what happens in our courses, so the general tip. Um, I'm going to focus today mainly on, on the Simon Gordon question from the homework. Um, it was solved correct by, I think, one and a half people in class. So I'm, I'm going to go through this step by step. I think those to summarize is pretty much everything we, we've learned how to do, Lagrangian, Hamiltonian, diagonalizing, and so on. And I'm also going to add a little bit to it uh, in the end to also incorporate some of the later um, uh, topics that we learned. And then in the second half, or the second part of this, uh, of this tutorial, I'll solve two smaller questions from the homework, just some that are they're actually more trivial, but it seems a lot of people have problems with them. So I'm going to go over them as well. Uh, and then if you have individual questions, then you can approach me afterwards. Um, depending on time, we might also make a break in the middle. We'll see how, how fresh we are and how much we um, how much power we have. So the sign Gordon question, that's homework two, question four. Um, we've all solved it, so I'm just going to quickly tell you what's given. We'll go right to answering. So there's an equation of motion, f motion for a field. Phi is a function of the field that depends on space and time, one dimension, or one plus one dimensions, one spatial and one temporal dimension. Uh, and it is a real field. It is a scalar field. Scalar means it's not a vector. So for each x and t, there is a number, not a vector. So it's called, it's what's called a scalar field, and it is real. There's no complex numbers. So it's the simplest kind of field you could imagine. Um, and it satisfies this equation of motion. And in A, you are asked, oh, and, and all of these stuff, you know, V, mu, and alpha, they are given constants, and they're also real, and they're positive. So really the simplest kind of uh, um, thing you could, you could imagine. So in A, you're asked to uh, write a Lagrangian um, such that you can obtain the equations of motion. Via Euler Lagrange. So when you're looking at something like this, I mean, there are a bunch of Lagrangians that, that you could guess, and some of them are totally wrong. So what uh, you should try and consider is um, how, so, so you see that inside the equation of motion, there's a second derivative over time and a second derivative over x. So what do you have to put into your Lagrangian so that when you apply all the Lagrange, you will get a second derivative uh, in the equation of motion? So I remind you that there is a term uh, in Euler Lagrange. There's this term that looks like d mu do L to do d mu phi. Right? So you're taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the derivative of the field. And then whatever comes out of here, you take the derivative on that same coordinate. Right? So this mu is the same mu as here. So if you derive your Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of phi, then you have to take the time derivative of that. And the same goes for x. Right? So, and this means that if you have in your Lagrangian, so if in the Lagrangian you have something that looks like, say, uh, do t phi squared, and you put this into, into here, 
then from taking the derivative over dot e phi, you get 2 times dot e phi, and then you take the derivative over dt. So this will give you twice dot t squared phi. See that? Yeah, and I'm trying to engineer my Lagrangian, so I'm looking at what does, what, what can I do with my Lagrangian? I have to use all Lagrange in the middle. So, so if I have a term like this in Lagrangian, I will get a term that looks like this in, in the Lagrangian. I'm going backwards, right. So what, the kind of Lagrangian that, that will make sense to guess using this kind of knowledge um, is, let's forget about the constants for the moment, let's just assume some constant A times uh, dot T e phi squared, and then some other constant times dot X phi squared. That will take care of the second derivative of time and second derivative in X. And then I need to add something that is a function of phi. And for this, I have to use the second part of Euler Grange, which is just the derivative over um, uh, respect to the coordinate itself. And if there's a sign here, there must be a cosine in the, uh, um, in the Lagrangian. So we'll take some other constant, c times the cosine of alpha phi. So this could be your initial guess. Well, Lagrangian, I'm taking care of each of the three terms, right? Three terms in the equation of motion, three terms in Lagrangian, that kind of makes sense. Uh, and I've taken care of all of the functional parts. All I have to do now is figure out how to choose A, B, and C so that I really get back, you know, in terms of V, mu, and alpha. Right, that's all I have to do now. So to do that, I'm going to take this Lagrangian, this sine Gordon Lagrangian, plug it into the uh, other Lagrange equations, and then require A, and A, B, and C to be such that it looks exactly the same. So let's put this into all the Lagrange. So when I plug this into all the Lagrange, um, do L, do phi minus do L dt to do dt phi minus dx dl d, dx phi equals zero, right? This is all the Lagrange. I hope this is not new. If it is, then write it down so you have it in the test. Um, and, and now I can plug my Lagrangian into here. Uh, I get three terms, C alpha sine alpha phi minus 2a dt squared phi minus 2b dx squared phi equals 0. And if I want this now to be equal to the equation of motion with all the constants and everything, I have to choose a is equal to 1 half, b is equal to minus v squared over 2, and c is equal to mu over alpha squared, or just by comparison. Bottom line, the Lagrangian, or Lagrangian density, is 1 half dt phi of x and t squared minus v squared over 2 x phi of x and t squared plus mu squared over alpha squared cosine of alpha times phi of x and t. This is called the sine Gordon Lagrangian. It's a famous thing. You can look it up on Wikipedia. So even if you couldn't solve it during the homework, you could have just looked up the answer. Of course, that's not relevant for a test, but I've now shown you how to think about this and how to get to, to where you have to get. Okay, in section B, we are asked to take a look at this Lagrangian. So, so section B is the one with the local and non-local part of the potential energy. Um, the section is meant just to try to think about this Lagrangian 
I'm trying to understand what the different terms mean. So you're asked to look at the potential energy and um, differentiate between the local and non-local part. And the, the idea is to really think of, to, to discretize space. When you discretize space, then you can really think of x as a index. Uh, it is important to remember in all of field theory, I think this should be kind of clear by now, that our coordinate is phi. Phi is the coordinate uh, of, of the Lagrangian and of the theory, and x and t are indices. You can think of this as a kind of lattice in, in two dimensions, where the dimensions are called x and t. Uh, and, and then for each point in this two-dimensional space, phi takes a different value. And then phi is the coordinate of the field. Is it up? Is it down? Is it two meters above? Is it one meter below? Whatever you want. Uh, and then there's also a conjugate momentum that belongs to this phi, not to x. x and t are just indices. Uh, and that's what this idea is here. Really write x as an index and not as a, uh, as a variable. So first of all, which, which part is the um, potential and which is the kind of kinetic energy? So you know, um, well, this becomes more clear actually in, in the next um, section. Um, but this part here will turn out to be the momentum so this thing here is the kinetic energy term. And then everything else is the potential energy. And this is in analogy to uh, analytical mechanics or, or classical mechanics, where Lagrangian is equal to kinetic minus potential energy. So potential energy is the negative of this thing. So if you want, you can write the potential energy as um, the same way, right, the same way the, the total Lagrangian uh, is the integral dt, sorry, the integral dx uh, over the Lagrangian density. In the same way, uh, I want to write the potential energy as an integral dx over the potential energy density. Right? Does this make sense? Right, the same way there's an integral dx to get the, in, the total Lagrangian. And so this is the, if this is Lagrangian density, this is the kinetic energy density, and this is the potential energy density. I right, integrate over dx, I get the total potential energy. And then this uh, potential energy density is, as I said, the minus, or so the negative of, of what appears in the Lagrangian. Um, and on the way, I'll also discretize space, as, as was um, hinted to here. So it's x plus dx, or plus delta x of t minus phi x of t over delta x squared, and then minus mu squared over alpha squared cosine alpha times phi x of t. And, and now it looks more obvious. This thing is a local term. If you think back at our, on our lattice, if I give you the location on, on x, so I say u at x equals x0, then you know the exact value of this thing. But if you look at your position at x, then you know this and you don't know this one. So you don't know what this term is equal to if you go to a specific position. In order to know what the, what this, what the contribution of this term is, you have to sit at a certain point in space and look around, look at neighboring sites. So that's why this is non-local. So if you have just a, a multimeter that measures at some point in space, you can tell this term, you cannot tell this term. You need two probes, one at x plus delta x and one at x, to understand what this term is. That's why this is non-local, and this is uh, a local term. 
Uh, and the local term uh, can be plotted um, as was asked in the question on, on kind of a 3D, let's see if I can do this, um, plot where one axis is phi. We're going to do this. So let's call this alpha phi. And let's call this x times l, just, I mean, I need some units. And well, I didn't tell this in the beginning, but x is defined um, between l minus l over 2 and, and l over 2. And, and phi is defined between um, pi over 2, sorry, between pi and minus pi, right? So it's, it's a compact system. Uh, and this is minus cosine, so it is equal to, I'm going to go this way as well, so this is, so here is pi, and here is minus pi. And now it's a cosine, so it's equal to minus 1, it's equal to 1 when phi equals 0, but as a minus sign. So it's equal to minus 1 here, and then it goes all the way up to plus 1, and then this is three-dimensional, so it's kind of like, because it does not depend on x explicitly, so it's the same anywhere in space. Um, you understand what I'm trying to draw? Is it clear? I mean, let's try it again. It's kind of like this, and like this. Yeah, does, does this make sense? It's like a blanket, like blanket folded in a weird way, yeah. Yeah, makes sense? And it's Winter Olympics. It's like when you go down uh, the sledge, you know, Togo Ban. So that's what the potential looks like, uh, and th that's the local part of the potential, right? So it depends. It depends on phi. It does not depend on x, right? What does the non-local part do? So this non-local part um, kind of acts like a spring. So you can kind of think of it as taking two points um, for for different x, so along this axis. And it kind of uh, acts as a spring between the two. You can think of this term. This is kind of equivalent to uh, to the potential energy of a spring, which is one half k x one minus x two squared. So this would be your x one and x two, your coordinates. It's phi at two different places, and it looks like the potential energy of a spring. So what this does is it kind of acts like a spring between two different um, coordinates. Uh, or to different indices on your lattice. OK, that was section B. Section C is quite methodological, but very important. You're asked to take the sine Gordon Lagrangian and derive the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian density from it. This is actually uh, very straightforward. You just have to plug into the formula of how to uh, go from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian, uh, Lagrange transformation. So first you need to write down the conjugate momentum of the field. which is equal to the derivative over the over phi dot of the uh, Lagrangian. And if you now look at our Lagrangian, we've done it before already when we did all the Lagrange, it just takes down this 2, it cancels, and you get dt phi. That's the conjugate momentum of x and t. So again, on this two-dimensional lattice, which is with the coordinates x and t, we now have the field. So we have the coordinate of, of the field, how far above or below the plane it is, and the momentum, so kind of its speed. Of course, this is all in analogy. This is not actually a, a lattice, right? It's all in analogy. But this analogy helps, especially when you're talking about real scalar fields where you can make this analogy. When you have more complex fields uh, or vector fields, you can't think of it in two dimensions anymore. But as long as you can do it, 
and it helps you for your intuition. Now we can write the Hamiltonian. Uh, so the Hamiltonian is uh, equal to, and remember this, uh, it's pi times dot t phi minus Lagrangian, right? That's how you, that's the general formula for finding a uh, Lagrangian. But we've already seen that dt phi, that is pi. So we just derived up here. So it's pi squared minus Lagrangian. But in the Lagrangian, you can also write this thing here as pi squared. Square. Now you have pi squared minus 1 half pi squared. So you get 1 half pi of x and t squared. And then just a minus sign on all the rest. So you get plus v squared over 2 in the x phi x and t squared minus mu squared over alpha squared cosine alpha phi of x and t. And you can now, sorry, no square. And you can now again look at the analogy to, to classical mechanics. A Lagrangian consists of phi and its time derivative. The Hamiltonian exists of phi. It can have its spatial derivative, but the time derivative of phi does not appear anymore. Instead, you've expressed it in terms of a momentum. So that's an analogy with stuff you know from like two years ago. Okay, so that's our uh, Lagrangian, our Hamiltonian, uh, and now and up to here everything was classical, right? So, so everything that was before here was classical, and now from here onwards we're going to start entering the quantum world. Uh, and the first thing you want to do in, in quantum mechanics is write a, a Hamiltonian operator. So the question is, how do we go from, so we want to quantize the system, that's, that's the question. And quantize is this, it's like a magic word. You take some classical thing that you know what it looks like, and you turn it into a operator. Um, and so the question is, the question is how to quantize a system. And the, the correct answer is, or the honest answer is, is that no one really knows how to quantize a system. The only answer we do have is that we have a few procedures that have over time proven to work. We don't really know why they work. Okay, and this is something that you should know about physics in general. All the quantum mechanics is one big guessing work and it just works really well. It works so well that everybody complains that quantum mechanics is not complete. There should be additional stuff. But every experiment we do just reestablishes how good quantum mechanics is. So although we don't have this, there's no experiment today that, except gravity, which is in part of quantum mechanics, but there's no experiment today that does not agree with the quantum mechanical prediction. So although people complain about how it's not going to have, which is guessing, it works superbly well. Okay? You, sh you should know this about something about in school of physicists. So one of these methods, there are a few methods, but the most common method to quantize a system is called canonical quantization. This is something you actually learn in, in QM1 already. In QM1, the way it works is you take the position and you turn it into the position operator. You take the momentum and turn it into the momentum operator. And then you have some representation. So this could be multiplication by x, and this could be ih bar ddx. Or you could put it in any other space. It doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, but you basically turn position and momentum into the position and momentum operators. So uh, in field theory, you do the same thing, but now our coordinate is not x, our coordinate is phi. Our momentum is not p, our momentum is pi. So you take these two classical fields. So these are classical fields on this, on this side. 
and you turn them into quantum mechanical operators. So you just call it phi hat and pi hat. That's why canonical quantization is sometimes called, uh, in, in, the, in the genre, it's called put on the hats. That's all you do. Right? It, it sounds really stupid. And it is stupid. That's why you should get it right, because it's a really stupid question. All you have to do is put on the hats, but there's one crucial thing, and that's what makes classical uh, physics different from quantum mechanics. So this is step one, put on the hats. And step number two is uh, you have to impose commutation relations. So the commutator of phi hat x and t with pi hat x prime and t has to be equal to i times delta x minus x prime. And setting h bar equals 1, as usual. And, and this is my postulate. And everything I do from now on, so for example, the reason in QM1 you chose x to be um, multiplication by, by x and this to be a derivative, was in order to satisfy this, or, or the QM1 analog of this, xp equals ih bar. But you had to choose your operator in such a way that this is satisfying. Every, everything we do from now on, any manipulation, any change of basis, anything we do has to, has to satisfy this uh, commutator. Okay? So there we are. That's uh, canonical quantization. That means it is now very easy to write down our Hamiltonian. I can just take that Hamiltonian. Where's my Hamiltonian? Gone. Oh, but this is, uh, oh, uh, equals this thing, right. So I want to change this into a, a, a uh, quantum Hamiltonian. All I have to do is this. There, I'm done. And then, of course, remember, you know, make a little asterisk in your head that this is satisfied. Uh, note, by the way, that uh, all commutators are equal time commutators. It's x and x prime equals delta, but we always take them at the same time. It's the same t on both sides. It's called equal time commutator, but this is kind of, we always take equal time commutators. Conjugate of f pi? Well, the commas conjugate? Pi is real. The, the, the it, it's, there's no dagger at the moment. We're not there yet. Phi and pi are real numbers. So we're getting there. We're getting there. We're not there yet. At the moment, there's no such thing yet. If phi is a complex field. Ah, yeah, then you would have absolute value pi squared, which is pi pi star, right? But that would, it would pop out automatically, though, because then also phi would be complex. I mean, if pi is complex, then you have to have phi com It wouldn't work otherwise. So, so it'll, uh, and it'll pop out automatically. You don't have to take care of that by yourself. You just use the same uh, methodology we did here, and, and it'll pop out automatically. OK, so next section, section E. What are we doing in section E? All right, now it's, just, now it's supposed to get interesting. In E, when you're told, or as you know, sine Gordon theory is not linear because of this term over here. Not linear. It cannot be diagonalized. You already know from uh, half a year of doing, quantum, or doing advanced quantum mechanics that anything that has operators squared can be diagonalized, but anything else cannot. And then you start doing weird stuff. Yes? That's exactly what we're going to do. I think you missed the homework. <laughs> That's exactly what we're going to do for the next 30 to 40 minutes. So because this cannot be diagonalized, we can expand in a Taylor series. Um, uh, and then we can take, say, the, the first term, which is as a constant. And then we can forget about this. 
uh, and just deal with, with this problem, which we can diagonalize, uh, or we can expand to higher orders. Um, so in E, you're told to um, expand the longer part to leading order. So to take cosine, don't really want to use x, um, cosine of z equals 1. Now that's a that's the leading order of cosine, and then you can diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So expand to leading order. Um, doing this, we will call our Hamiltonian HP. So we'll approximate that the sine Gordon Hamiltonian is approximately equal to what I call HP. P stands for phonon. Well, as you will see, this is a phonon Hamiltonian, so a massless particle. And then when you've done this, you want to diagonalize. Diagonalize means uh, that you're going to write down a diagonal Hamiltonian, and you also want to find the excitation spectrum. So how do we diagonalize? So we're now going to write 1 here instead of the cosine. So this is a constant. I mean, I'm going to keep the constant, I think. But what you could do in general, and probably should do, um, is just shift your energy by this amount, because this is a constant, right? And forget about it. But I'm, I'm going to keep it just for, for bookkeeping. Um, but there's nothing wrong about just getting rid of it at this point already. Um, so to diagonalize, there, we do this typically in two steps. Step number one is to go to k space, so go from x to k. Uh, and step number two, go from k space to a and a dagger. So step number one, we want to go from x to k space, so we're going to expand our fields. In, in plane waves. Both the phi and both the phi have the same x, or is it still the same x prime? Come again? When we wrote the permutations uh, with the delta, yeah. So phi is at the point x, and phi is at x prime. Well, it's, it's a dummy variable. Who cares? Uh, and here you mean by is not? Uh, yeah. Uh, there's comma. There's, there's two different expressions. What you're suggesting is to write prime here and prime here? Yes. So I'll redefine x prime equals prime and get rid of the prime. What I'm, I don't understand what you're trying to do. This is independent of this. So I have to plug in whatever is written in the Hamiltonian. In the Hamiltonian, if I'm taking pi of x squared, then that's so pi of x times pi of x, and it's the same x. Same x. Okay. Right? But, that, but that's given by the Hamiltonian. Okay. Right? There's something else you should pay attention to at this point. It, look, it looks like a typo. 
Excuse me? The case. For now? The ca yeah, for, because they're two different equations. I don't care about them at the moment. Okay. If I put them both in the same equation, I have to, I have to use a K prime to make sure I don't get confused. Yeah. But there's something more important. Guys, what, 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 what looks weird here? It looks like a typo, but it's not. Yeah, e to the ikx, e to the minus ikx. It's not a typo. Yeah, that's the commutation. Right, I have to do this in order to satisfy this commutation relation. So I, if I would, so one of the common mistakes is to just put here e to the ikx and forget about this minus sign and just continue. And what you've then done is you've done step number one in canonical, computation, in canonical quantization, but you've totally forgotten about step number two. Anything you do from here onwards has to satisfy this equation. If it doesn't, you're wrong. Okay? That is correct. That is correct. Um, you just choose either one. So let's uh, let's just prove this for a second. So what we have to satisfy is that the commutator between phi k of t and pi k prime of t that needs to equal i delta k k prime. There's still position and momentum uh, of the field. Um, so we still have to satisfy the same uh, commutation relation, but we need this transformation to to uh, to agree with both this and this. So let's just prove that, just to see that we know what we're doing. So let's take let's prove this on the next board. Um, so I'm going to take phi of x and t and pi of x and t as I've defined them as a sum over k and plug them into uh, this commutator, the, the, the x, the x space commutator. And then I'm going to assume that the k space commutator is correct and I'll see whether indeed I can reproduce the right hand side. So the commutator of phi of x and t and pi of x prime and t so I'm going to plug in, this is the commutator sum over k, um, e to the i k x phi, these are hats by the way, phi k of t. And this has to commute with sum over k e to the minus i k x um, pi k of t. And here I had x prime, so here I had x prime. Right, that's to your question, if not, I'm just plugging in whatever's written here. I have x prime here, so I have to use x prime here. But they remain the same. Well, I'm going to put an index, uh, I'm going to switch index in a moment because I have two sums. Right, this one sum. Will be k and the other one will be k prime. So I can't put in the Of course not, because cause this sum only extends over these two terms. You don't want this sum extending over this, over this pi, right? That's just uh, mathematical tricks that I don't get confused. So that's indeed what we're going to do right now. We're going to add primes to these k's here. So we don't get confused. Now we can open up, or now we can take out um, the, the constant stuff out of the commutator. So there's a sum over k and k prime e to the i k x minus i k prime x prime. No brackets yet. They're different k's and different x's at the moment. And then there's a commutator over phi k of t and pi k prime of t. And let's assume that this is correct. It has to be correct. Let's assume it is correct. And there are the two options. Either we prove this is correct given that this is true, or we prove this is correct given this is true. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, so, so I'm going for the second option. So if this is true, uh, then here I get i delta k, k prime. I can take the i outside and do the sum over k prime. So there's a sum i, it's a i times sum over k, 
Now k is equal to k prime, so I can write this as e to the i k x minus x prime. And this, by definition, is a delta in x, so this is equal to i delta x minus x prime, and indeed, it's satisfied. Right? So I have to choose here different signs, a plus here and a minus here. Otherwise, I'm inconsistent with my quantization method. Okay, so we're still in the first step of uh, the analyzing. We have to take our Hamiltonian from x space to k space. We now have our transformation. We we'll verify that it works. It satisfies the laws of quantum mechanics. And now we can go to our x space Hamiltonian and plug in the transformation. So the Hamiltonian, which I remind you are now calling HP. So I've already done the approximation that cosine is equal to 1. So there's 1 half sum over k, k prime, e to the i, k plus k prime x pi k pi k prime. These are all functions of t. And they are operators. So I've plugged it in twice. Or I've, I've used this the connection for pi in the first term, in the kinetic term. And I've just grouped together the exponents. They both have a plus sign. There's no compass conjugation in, in there. It's gone. But in the original Hamiltonian, there's no compass conjugation, so it's the same sign. And here, when I plug in phi, remember there was a do x phi. When you take the derivative over x of, of this expression, you take down ik. And for the second one, you take down ik prime. Again, no minus sign. There's no compass conjugation. And you have your phi k, phi k prime. And this is the constant, which, as I said, if you want, you can forget about it. Or you can keep it just for, for uh, honest bookkeeping, whatever you prefer. Now, at this point, you should remember that this is the Hamiltonian density. But what actually matters to us is the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian density depends on x, depends on where you go in space. Or if you do Fourier transform, it depends on k. But the total Hamiltonian is a number, it's the total energy. It does not depend on anything, not on x, not on k. It's just the total Hamiltonian of the system. And the total Hamiltonian is therefore the integral dx over hp. Or equivalently, after you do Fourier transform, it could be equal to the sum over k over, you can call it h tilde if you want, but give it the same name. So this could be h in x space or h in k space. At the moment, this Hamiltonian is an x in k space. Yeah, that was the problem in the second question I saw today. This is an expression in x space, not in k space. You're summing over k and k prime. So by the time you've done your sums, there will be no k's left. No k, no k prime, no any other k's. x, on the other hand, will remain here. So this is still a function of x. Okay? I'm going to stress this again in the second part of today. So what I want to do here now uh, is use the integral dx, which I have to apply here, and that I can use to get out a, a delta function. So the total Hamiltonian, not the density, but a total Hamiltonian, which is a number, the energy of the system does not depend not on x, not on k, not on time, not on anything. Well, it can depend on time, actually. But not on x, not on k. If it's a conserved quantity, it doesn't depend on time. But it's not necessarily conserved. Um, so this is equal to 1 half sum over k and k prime. Pi k, pi k prime. 
I'll, I'll stop writing function of t every single time, just to save some, some space and, and effort. Uh, and now I'm going to use the integral dx e to the i k plus k prime x, and so on. Same goes for the next term as well. So there's an i k i k prime i k phi k prime integral dx k plus k prime x and then integral dx u squared over alpha squared. Which is again just a constant because integral dx is just equal to L. Remember that it's defined to minus and plus L, so it's just a different constant. Right? This was a constant in the Hamiltonian density, and if you sum over the entire space, you get the density times the volume, so it's, a, it's still a constant. Oh, we spoke about, ah, we're missing one minus sign, are we? Oh yeah, we're missing a minus sign somewhere. It doesn't really matter for, for what's going to come, but yeah, we had pi, pi is e to the minus i k x, right? So where the pi's are, we had a minus here, are you correct? All right. There's a minus here. It doesn't really matter because a delta function is a symmetric function. So it doesn't make much of a difference, but you, you're right. Uh, now we can make a delta function. This thing here is delta k, k prime. And this thing here is delta k, k prime. Okay, and, and, and the easy way to see it is that you're, you're integrating out x. So after you integrate out x, this thing cannot depend on x, right? So, I don't know, for some reason, uh, in, in the second homework we're going to do, people kind of try to say something like sum over k and k prime e to the i k plus k prime x, that this thing together is a delta in k. Of course, that's impossible. You're summing over k. How is it a function of k? So how are you summing over k up to here when this depends on k? You cannot just take this away, you know. Over half of people in, in the room did it. So I don't know what went wrong there. Maybe it's just bad copying from the wrong person. But it was really surprising. Okay, in any case, uh, I now have delta functions. I can now do the sum over k prime. And um, I get a nice expression for the Hamiltonian. Um, Excuse me? It should be, yeah. Let's, let's write it properly. This is delta of k plus k prime like this. And k plus k prime like this. So k, k, k prime is equal to minus k. Right? Because there's a plus sign in the exponent. So there's a sum over k. And then there's one half pi k pi minus k. plus v squared over 2. And now i times i is minus 1, but k prime is equal to minus k, so that gives a plus sign again. And then there's k squared phi k phi minus k. And then we're left with minus u squared over alpha squared. And of course, summing over all of um, all, over all x's over a constant is the same as summing over all k's over all space uh, over a constant. That's exactly the thing. It's still taking into account all the space. So this is our Hamiltonian. And then this thing here in the brackets, that's the Hamiltonian density. But it's now written in k space. It is now a function of k. And as you notice, x doesn't appear anymore. Right here, x did appear. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. Now we can start thinking about our daggers. Because uh, 
pi and pi in, in x space, they were real. That was given. But now we've defined, um, so this, although i appears here, this sum after sum over k, it cannot turn out to be real. Specifically, so you know when this happens, if phi k is even in k, then phi of x is real, right? That's a um, property of Fourier transform. No? Well, OK. You should know that by now. The transform of a real function is symmetric, and vice versa. Have you heard of that? No? OK. Don't forget Fourier transform, uh, just because you've finished uh, second year physics. Fourier transform is one of the most important things you've learned in, in, in your undergraduate studies. Um, so we can now take this to our advantage, namely, um, if you look at our um, transformation, you see that phi k uh, star, so let's, let's talk classical first. You see that phi k star is equal to phi minus k. Right, so just take the inverse of this transformation uh, and you'll see it right away. e to the I -X I -K -X and e to the minus i k x are related either by plugging in k equals minus k or by taking a common conjugate. Right? Uh, and the same goes for pi, but if we now go to, to quantum mechanics, so to QFT, when these are fields, then what this means is that the Hermitian conjugate, which is a generalization of complex conjugate to operators, so the Hermitian conjugate of phi k is equal to uh, phi, the operator phi minus k. And the same is true for pi. And hence we can write the Hamiltonian density, which is an operator, I've got my hat here. Uh, the Hamiltonian density is therefore one half um, pi k pi k dagger plus v squared over 2 phi k, sorry, k squared phi k um, phi k dagger minus mu squared over alpha squared. And now this maybe starts looking a little more familiar like Hamiltonians that you're used to seeing in, in quantum mechanics. But as you see, it's just exactly the same thing as we had earlier. We just used uh, the, the properties that come out of this transformation to our benefit. But some people prefer writing it like this, and some people prefer writing it like this. I prefer this. I don't like k's and minus k's in my expressions if I can avoid it. But it's the same thing. Okay, so that was step one, right? Step one, we went from x to k. Well done. Step number two, we have to go from k to a and a dagger. So how do we go from a from k and a dagger? So, so what we want, it is what we have, and what we want is an expression that looks like, um, or that is proportional, to, or let's say it's equal to omega k, a dagger k, a k plus some constants. We don't care about constants. We want an expression that is just the number operator times some whatever. There's going to be some coefficient here. That coefficient is the excitation spectrum that we were asked to find in the question. So we now want to find a transformation that will take us from here to here. That's the question. How do we do this? Right? Is that clear? This is what we call a diagonal Hamiltonian. It's a diagonal because there's only one k. There's no k, k prime. It's just a number operator. So at this stage, it might be a good idea to look back at what you did in the lecture. And so you actually solved exactly this Hamiltonian 
just with different constants. Instead of v squared and, and mu and stuff like that, you had rho s, which was an uh, elastic chain. Uh, but it's exactly the same thing. Um, but I'm going to try and kind of hand wave derive what we have to do. Um, not exactly from zero, because that'll take until after the test, but uh, I'll kind of hand wave the idea of what's going on. So remember that the uh, essence of everything that's going on are always commutation relations. You always have to satisfy these commutation relations. And also, A and AK have to satisfy certain commutation relations. Um, in fact, if they are to be indeed creation and annihilation operators, then they have to satisfy the commutator that AK and AK dagger prime is equal to delta K K prime. So either one if the k's are the same, or zero if the k's are different. So we need to think of a transformation. We need to think of how to turn phi and pi into A and A dagger, such that this is satisfied, and this is satisfied. It's gone. The, the same thing for the phi case, right? Phi k, phi k prime needs to be equal to i delta k k prime. We need to satisfy this and this, or given that one is satisfied, the other has to be satisfied. And we have to choose a uh, uh, such a uh, um, what's it called? Uh, such a transformation. And another thing we have to do is uh, we need to substitute phi. So we want phi to be equal to say phi k needs to be equal to say some superposition of a k dagger plus a k. We want to do it in such a way that when we plug this transformation into, uh, into the Hamiltonian, we only want the terms with a dagger a, or the opposite, a a dagger to survive. We don't want a dagger a dagger to survive. We don't want a times a to survive. They have to be cancelled in some magical way. We're going to have to choose, we have to do the magic, by put it in with our hands. So. Um, First of all, by just um, considering the, commut the commutators, um, let me show to you that this kind of superposition where A is this kind of uh, um, expansion, where A is just a constant, actually works. So I obviously want something that is linear. That phi, I want obviously I want phi to be linear in A and A dagger because phi appears quadratically in the Hamiltonian. And if I want only terms that are quadratic in A, well, if I have any terms that are quadratic in phi, they're going to be uh, quartic in, in, in the end, right? So it's obvious I only want um, quadratic terms. I only want linear terms in phi and in pi. And then this choice with no i here, but an i here, you could do vice versa as well, but this choice will take care of our commutators. So let's show this uh, specific, uh, explicitly. So I'm going to commute phi k with pi k prime. Uh, and the reason I chose some a is because a priori I don't know what this a is, because when I now do the commutator, it will cancel. So I put it in, I have to use it later so the bright terms remain and the wrong terms cancel. But for the moment, I just have to put it in by hand. So I get here i over 2. And then there's an ak dagger plus ak. And this, take the commutator of this and ak dagger minus ak. When I take this commutator, uh, there are four terms, but two of them are just 0. So ak dagger, sorry, there are primes here. A k dagger with A k prime dagger is zero. Then A k and this A k that is minus A k dagger A k prime. And then here is one more, which is plus A k A k prime dagger. And then the last one also cancels. And of course, these are all operators.
this is equal to minus delta kk prime, this is equal to delta kk prime, and in total you get i delta kk prime. So again, I've assumed this commutator to prove that this is satisfied. So this transformation is a legal transformation. Okay? Next step. Okay, so we've proven that this works. So now let's plug this into our Hamiltonian. There are two terms that we have to evaluate, namely pi times pi dagger. Right, this is one term that appears in the Hamiltonian. So I take this and multiply it by its Hermitian conjugate which is easy to take, put a minus sign, the dagger goes away, put a dagger here. And that's easy. And we multiply this out, and what we get is 1 over 2a squared, a dagger a minus a dagger a dagger minus a k a k plus a k a k dagger. And the same we can do for phi. If I multiply phi by phi k dagger, which is the second term that appears in the Hamiltonian, I get a squared over 2, a k, a k, a dagger k, a k, plus a k, a k, daggers. That was simple algebra. And now let's look what's going on. So I'm going to put this uh, pi times pi dagger, I'm going to plug this into here. And I'm going to take this phi and phi dagger and plug it into here. And I want to have at the end, I, want to, I, don't, I only want to remain with a dagger a, and I'm also okay with a a dagger because I can then use the commutator to switch the order. But I want all the double dagger terms and all the double non-dagger terms to cancel. And in order to do that, I have to choose a appropriately. So if you stare at this for like a minute, maybe two, you can figure out what a should be. So if we choose a squared, right? It's, it's in the denominator for the pi's, but in the numerator for the phi's. So if we choose a to be one, we don't care about the one half, that's the same for both, but there's a vk squared here. So if a can make this the same power of vk, so say if we choose a squared equal to one over vk, right, that'll give that will give one power of vk for the pi's, and it will cancel one of the, the, the square here, so then they have the same coefficient. And if they have the same coefficient, then these terms will cancel, because there's a minus and a plus, and these terms will cancel, there's a minus and a plus, and we remain only with the cross terms. See that? Two different coefficients? So then they wouldn't cancel and they, they would, that would, then this won't work. But if, if, if you choose here A, here B, right? Then you will carry A over B to the very end. You will get I delta KK prime A over B. And, then and that it has to be equal to this. So obviously A equals B, right? Be more general, but you could prove it. Yeah, because you have to satisfy, if, well, if, you're, if you're honest with yourself and you actually check. Yeah. 
right? But if you're honest with yourself and you check the commutators, then you will get A equals B, otherwise the commutator won't work. Right? And I didn't have to choose the square root 2 here. I could have chosen this just A, this just B, no I, no square root 2, but it would have popped out of here. Right? I just I knew what's going to happen, so I chose it accordingly. And then when I have A, there's one more left. I choose it such that the cross terms cancel. So after we've done this, what do we get? So I'm going to plug it all in. So we now have, where am I? We now have HP is equal to VK over 2 A dagger KAK plus AK AK dagger. And then there's our constant minus mu squared over alpha squared. We're almost there. It's almost diagonal. That is diagonal already, but it's almost in our desired form. We can now use the commutator one more time to switch the order in the second term. And we can write this as omega k, a dagger k, a k plus one half minus mu squared over alpha squared, where omega k is equal to vk. This, of course, is the Hamiltonian density, the total Hamiltonian the, the number, the energy, so the energy of the system is equal to sum over k over omega k a k dagger a k plus one half minus mu squared over alpha squared. That is the total Hamiltonian. So if you sum over all modes, Omega k is a linear dispersion, dispersion relation that reminds you of phonons. So you've now learned that sine Gordon without the cosine is just a phonon or a photon, whatever you want, depends on what V is. Right? Um, you've learned the meaning of V in your original equation of motion. So that's that. Questions so far? This was very detailed on purpose so that, oh sorry, so that this will make sense later. Yes? Yeah. You assume like there's no connection between phi of x to x in the graph. Well, there is, but again, phi. I don't know what this connection is, yeah, yeah. right? So, so in classical physics, I could, I would want the function phi of x to be such that the action is minimalized, right? But we're now into quantum mechanics where phi is an operator, so that doesn't really work anymore, right? I, I'm just saying that you, you draw a graph, but you don't know the relation between phi to x, but still the graph is like. Right. So again, you, you stop thinking about phi. You stop thinking about x as a variable. X is the index. And phi takes a certain value at each index x. Right? That's, a, that's the way to think about it. Uh, and when phi takes a value at each in the index x, you don't need to know the relation, because there is a different phi, and the phi can be a function of time at every x. So I, I, in this example, I try to illustrate this, uh, that I think of some kind of 2D plane, where I call this the x axis and this the t-axis, but try to think of this uh, sort of kind of like x and y, and then at each point in space, you can define a phi of t. And then here is another phi of t, right? So I, I quantize, I, I put here the uh, indices, this is phi of x, right? Because it's at a certain position, right? Uh, and here as well. Uh, so that's how I think about these fields. So you don't know the relation between phi and x because phi is defined at every x. The question is not posed properly. It's, it's not a legal question. It just, it down to a 2D graph, not a 3D graph, because 
Well, if you now want to draw the energy, well, that is something else again. What I did, what I did there is I asked, what is the energy as a function of phi, right? The, the, the local part of the of the potential as a function of phi. Um, but of course, phi is defined for every x. If the non-local part would not exist, the question would be boring because then each phi would evolve independently, and you could turn into a, into just such a graph phi and v, and you wouldn't and you wouldn't care about x because they're not coupled, right? This non-local term is like a spring that couples different x's. That's what makes the problem interesting or difficult, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> okay. So, so the, the point is to think of x as, a, as an index, not as a variable. OK, section F. We're now going to do something quite similar, but now we're going to expand the cosine to second order, so it's 1 minus z squared over 2. And in this case, the sine Gordon Hamiltonian will be approximately equal to the, well, we call it, when we do, when we do this approximation, we call the Hamiltonian the Klein Gordon Hamiltonian, which is a very famous Hamiltonian for any of you who are going to continue in particle physics, which is probably no one. But if you do, if you ever hear someone talking about particle physics, can say Klein Gordon, and they'll be like, yay. Um, so, so when we do this, what, what does our Hamiltonian look like? And I'm uh, going to start from the very beginning again. So I'm back in x space before doing any transformations. So there's a pi hat of x and t squared plus v squared over 2 dot x phi hat x and t squared minus mu squared over alpha squared plus mu squared over alpha squared times phi hat of x and t squared. So we've added an additional term. Um, and it might look more complicated because the additional term is not just a constant. We can't just you know, shift it away. That would be easy. Um, Actually, once had someone who did it in the homework. So let's just shift the potential by phi squared. Yeah, you can't do that. That's your variable. You cannot shift it away. Um, it doesn't really work. Um, but uh, but it's not, it doesn't worry us too much because we, it's still quadratic. And we know that we can diagonalize quadratic stuff. We actually know that the only stuff that we can diagonalize is quadratic stuff. So as long as it's quadratic, we're fine. Uh, and the way to do it is exactly the same way as we did before. And I don't even have to repeat everything because I'll be able to recycle some of the stuff that we did. But step number one, x to k. Step number two, k to a dagger and a. Uh, we've already proven that we, ha we already had our transformation from x to k. The same thing works here because it's the same commutators. Right, the Hamiltonian is different, but that doesn't matter. So we can use the same transformation here as well. Um, let me cut a long story short. Well, we've already done the pi and the phi part and the dx phi part. We're only left with this phi part. And you can probably guess what's going to happen. And if not, then you may do it explicitly. But it's no more complicated than what we already did. So you get um, h Klein Gordon is equal to 1 half pi k pi k dagger plus v squared over 2 k squared phi k phi k dagger minus mu squared over alpha squared. This is the part we already did. And the only addition now is mu squared over alpha squared and the Fourier transform of phi of x squared, which is phi phi dagger. Right? Um, so we have phi k phi k dagger. Now look how beautiful, phi k phi dagger, phi k phi dagger. Let's group them together. For some reason, no one knew how to, like it was like one person who, who got to here and then realized that we could just put them together. But it's really trivial, obviously. It's phi k, phi k dagger, plus 
um, v squared. I'm missing a two somewhere, right? Wait a minute. Sorry, this is wrong. This is mu squared over two, because when you take the, the derivative, so so z is alpha times phi. So your alpha cancels, and you're left with two from the expansion. Right? Sorry about that. Um, and so you, when you group them together, you have one half v squared k squared plus mu squared, and then phi k phi k dagger, and then some constant which is irrelevant. Now we're, we're intelligent people, right? Or at least we're claiming that we are. What is the difference between the Klein-Gordon Hamiltonian? and the phonon Hamiltonian. The only difference is that instead of vk, or v squared k squared, we now have v squared squared plus mu squared. So obviously the second step, which was really messy up here, is exactly the same step. The only difference is we now have to choose a squared as one over this thing, right? Or square root of this thing, as we did up here. And that will turn out to be omega k. So uh, from here, it's really a, a baby step uh, that the Klein-Gordon Hamiltonian density um, is just omega k. Well, it's the same Hamiltonian as we had, the exact same Hamiltonian. Where did I write it? The exact same Hamiltonian as we had here. Here it is. Omega k, a k dagger a k plus 1 half minus mu squared over alpha squared. Um, but now the only difference is that omega k is equal to square root of v squared k squared plus mu squared. Read. So if you've done it once, you can do it now a million times. As long as, as long as you add terms in your Hamiltonian that are quadratic in phi, you know, add as many as you want. The only thing that will be different is that the coefficients of these quadratic terms will enter your dispersal relation. That's the only thing that's going to happen. Um, this should also this dispersal dispersion relation should also look kind of familiar. This is a relativistic uh, massive particle. It's like e squared equals p square root of p e squared equals p c squared plus m c squared squared, right? So now you know what the meaning of mu is. Mu is the mass of the particle. Right, c is equal to 1. So mu is the mass of the particle. Again, v is the, the, the speed, um, the velocity. So this is your dispersion relation. So Klein-Gordon, when you take two terms, becomes a massive particle, or the excitations are massive particles. This does not mean that massless particles are approximations of massive particles. They're two different Hamiltonians, which has derived them from some general sign Gordon. But you cannot approximate massive particles with massless particles. That, that doesn't work. Kind of obvious. Um, OK, now uh, the homework was up to here, but I, I want to add some things here. First of all, some technical stuff, uh, just to be, be sure that we know what we're talking about. And then I'm going to go one step further and try and deal with the phi to the fourth term. So the next term in the cosine. Let us sit forever. We might take a break before the five, five fourth term. But let me just uh, kind of like. Um, well, in, in, in the notes, I don't think I've uploaded them yet, did I? I didn't upload these notes. I'm going to upload them um, after we finish here today, so you can look at it again. Uh, here I uh, kind of turn this into a question where you ignore constant terms uh, in the Hamiltonian, and then the question is, uh, what are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian? 
what are the eigenenergies? And what are um, and what is the general wave function? <coughs> the most general wave function that you can write that satisfies the Schrodinger equation uh, H Klein Gordon times psi is equal to E times psi. But it's still a Hamiltonian, it still satisfies the Schrodinger equation. So this is just, it's very, quite trivial, it's just to make sure that we don't get lost in informalism and, and remember uh, the physics of what's going on. So the, um, if we neglect all the constants in the Hamiltonian, so we're going to neglect the, uh, this part here, the, the mu squared uh, over alpha squared, and we're also going to uh, neglect this part, so it's omega k times one half, but you have to use sum over all k's, it's not a constant term. It happens to be infinitely large, but it's a constant infinity. It doesn't depend on the number of particles in the system, right? It's called the vacuum energy. Um, it's actually an interesting point. The vacuum energy has an infinitely amount of energy. I don't know if, if I spoke about this during class. The energy of the vacuum, so zero particles is infinite. Infinite electron volts or joules or whatever you want. Uh, so it's an interesting thing to think an interesting thing to think about. But the point is that we don't really care about a cons an infinite background because we only know how to measure energy differences. So there's an infinite amount of energy. On top of that, we can excite particles that have energy VK. We can measure that VK. We cannot measure the infinite background. So as far as we're concerned, it could be zero. So we'll set infinity equal to zero and, and we're fine. The question is how can we measure the vacuum energy? I'll let you think about that when you can't sleep at night. Okay, so what, uh, what is the total Hamiltonian when we neglect all constant terms? Klein Gordon equals sum over k, omega k, a dagger k, a k, and omega k, we've already written this a million times, square root v squared k squared plus mu squared. This is the total Hamiltonian, the eigenstates are Fox states with well-defined K states. So the most general state, sorry, the eigenstates are of the Hamiltonian are Fox states with, uh, say, N1 particles or NK1 particles in state K1, NK2, and so on until I call this nk infinity, just to symbolize that there's an end at some point, some you know, cutoff or whatever, but this could extend really, really long. Uh, the eigenenergies, well, that's also simple. So what are the quantum numbers? What are the quantum numbers? Yes, but for each case, there are, there are an infinite number of quantum numbers. It's the entire set nk1, nk2, and so on. Remember, the quantum numbers are the numbers that you need to define your state. So if I give you, I tell you how many particles are in each k state, then you know which state you're in. And if I change one of these numbers, we're in a different state, which is orthogonal to the previous state. So the quantum numbers are in this long list now. But k is not your quantum number. k is the momentum defines the states. It, it's not your quantum number. The quantum numbers are the uh, uh, occupations. Uh, and so the energy depends on the quantum numbers, depends on nk1, nk2, and so on, up to nk infinity. And it's equal to the sum over all k's, say k1 to k infinity, over all omega k times the number of particles in that state k. And then the 
most general wave function is just a superposition of all possible eigenstates. So that's the sum over all of these uh, quantum numbers. Some coefficient that depends on all quantum numbers. And it's the Fox states. So here I'm trying to relate this new weird looking Hamiltonian back to what you know from QM1. You still have eigenstates and eigenenergies and general states, and you cannot technically start evolving this in time. You know, you, you find C from initial conditions and evolve it in time by plugging E to the I energy for each state. You know, that's all exactly the same. It's just now a many part Hamiltonian, and in this case, it's all non interacting. Like in K space, this Hamiltonian is non interacting. So, so if time evolution, so all that stuff is easy when it's non interacting. It's when it's interacting that it gets complicated. Questions about this? Kind of obvious. So let's. אה, אני אתחיל עוד ממש שתי דקות. אתה עכשיו? יאללה. תקשיב, עכשיו נזכר. לא קורה לה שהיא רוצה להגיד משהו, ואז יושב לה במחור של השכל, עד שפשוט מתעצבנת ומוציאה את זה עליך בעצבים? לא, אבל בהתחלה בעליך. 2018 מועד ב', אתה זוכר את השאלה? לא, ממש לא. טוב, בוא נעשה את זה אחר כך, מה את אומרת? כי זה כנראה ייקח יותר מדקה. זה די קצר, מהסיבה הפשוטה של דברים שהם נעלמים. כאילו, עזוב, תתחיל לרצות את זה. יש את הלגרנדיאן הזה. אוקיי. אנחנו עושים משוואות. אני לא יודע מה דומה למה שעושים פה. אנחנו עושים שתי שדות. כן, כן. אתה מקבל אחר כך איזשהו פסאי, פסאי 1, פסאי 2, אתה מגדיר פסאי מינוס, פסאי פלוס, לא משנה, זה סדר. אוקיי. אחר כך בסוף אומרים לכתוב את הלגרנג'יאן בפסאי פלוס, פסאי מינוס, ולחשב את ההימולטוניאן. עכשיו, כשאתה עושה את ההימולטוניאן, שתראה בפסאי פלוס ופסאי מינוס, הם נעלמים. אוקיי, מעניין. אז שם כאילו... לא, זה יכול להיות, אני לא יודע מה זה אומר פיזיקלית, אבל זה יכול להיות, כן. אני גם לא יודעת מה זה אומר פיזיקלית, ובשאלה הבאה מבקשים אחר כך לעשות כאילו כמו שעשינו כאן עם להעביר למרחב פיזיקלי, ואז לקוונטט. אוקיי. אז התחלתי לעשות את זה, אבל אז הבנתי פאי נעלם, וזה היה נראה לי נורא מוזר. זאת אומרת, פה עשיתי... זה נשמע לי גם קצת מוזר, זה נשמע לי גם מוזר, לא הייתי מצפה לזה, אבל אם זה קרה ובדקתי את המתמטיקה ואין לך תיעוד סימן. כן, לא, לא, זה לא צפוי, אבל לא בטוח אם זה לא נכון. לא מחייב. אוקיי, זה לא מבק? From the dead? So, as announced, we're not going to try to do the next term. Of course, this never ends, you know, we could spend the rest of our life expanding more and more orders in... In phi, I'm going to suggest a really simple treatment for phi fourth, although this can be made much more complicated. And there's actually a whole um, topic in, uh, uh, in QFT called phi fourth theory, which is how to deal with this phi to the fourth term in the Klang Gordon Hamiltonian. Um, if you look at Peskin and Schroeder, there's a whole chapter devoted to it. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, this is where Feynman diagrams become important. 
real diamond diagrams, not just drawings that look like drawings, but actual, there's a whole procedure behind what we call Feynman diagrams. It's not just making funny drawings. Uh, so it goes beyond what, what you do with the thought in the class. Um, but in any case, I'm, I'm going to suggest a real simple treatment where we just um, uh, treat the, this additional term, this 5 4 term, uh, pertub pertubatively. Uh, and we're just going to uh, calculate the first order correction to the vacuum energy. And this will be a good uh, exercise to figure out how we get rid of you. We're going to have a lot of terms, and we're going to have to get rid of a lot of them. We're going to use some physical intuition to get rid of them. Uh, and, and we'll also be able to apply Wick's theorem, which is always good to go over. Um, so let's, let's get into it. So I'm going to start with the klein gordon hamiltonian as we wrote it uh, up here. I'm going to neglect all of these constant terms. They're gone now. Okay. Actually, I'm not neglecting them. I've shifted the energy by infinity such that they, they go away. Uh, and what we have left then is the following Hamiltonian. Sum over k, omega k, a k dagger a k. That's the Klein-Gordon part. And then there's an intuition, uh, an interaction term, which is just the fourth order term. So there's a four factorial from the Taylor expansion. And then this, for the moment, is still in x space. So this is phi of x and t to the fourth. Uh, it's, this is a little bit weird notation, but it's, it's consistent. Uh, in this part, I'm summing over k. And in this part, I'm summing over x. So in the end, both this term and this term are numbers. None of them actually depend on, on x or k. So this is consistent. This is the total Hamiltonian. It's units of energy. It looks a little weird because here I'm summing over k space and here over x space. So obviously my first step will be to put this into x space as well. But as you know, this is not going to be diagonal in, in k space. Right, so I, I won't be able to make it look too simple, but I can definitely do the transformation. Uh, just a little piece of notation. I'm going to call uh, this minus mu squared alpha squared. I'm going to call this lambda. And then it's lambda over 4. Uh, factorial times phi to the fourth. And this is like the typical notation if you open up uh, one of those books with phi four theory, lambda is the typical coupling constant for phi four. It's just like a notation that, that is used by most people. Okay, so let's look at the interaction term. And I want to go to k space. So I now have to plot for each individual phi, right? There are four phi's here. Phi times phi times phi times phi. And I have to use the Fourier transform that we've already proved to be correct into every single one. So I'll have four different sums over four different k's. <laughs> and I'm going to call them k1 through k4. Um, so let's do this. So there's a lambda over 4 factorial integral dx. And then there are four sums, k1, k2, k3, k4, e to the i k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4 x. And then we have our four phi's. There's a phi k1, phi k2, phi k3, and phi k4. All I've done so far is plugged in the expansion of phi of x and t in terms of phi k, four different times. And not very complicated. Uh, as we always do, we now take the integral dx together with the exponent, and that gives um, a delta function. Of course, the physical meaning of this delta function is conservation of momentum. So from here, we get delta k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4, which basically means that k4 can be written as minus k1, minus k2, minus k3. So just to save some notation, I'm going to continue to write k4. Um, and only in the end, I'm going I'm to use this kind of uh, 
relation, I'm uh, actually going to write the delta function explicitly for the moment, and we're going to worry about it later. So h int is now lambda over 4 factorial sum over all the different k's, k1, k2, k3, k4. And then we have our four phi's, phi k1, phi k2, phi k3, phi k4, delta k1. I'm not using it yet. Uh, I could use it now. It doesn't make a difference, but it'll turn out to be a little easier mathematically to keep it to the end. When I solved it the first time, I didn't do it, then realized I shouldn't have. So, you know, you learn by doing it. Also, I do. Um, so that was step number one, right? Uh, remind you, step number one is go from x to k. And then step number two is to go from k to a and a dagger. Um, but we cannot just, we have to use the same transformation that we used here. So this, the, the capital A squared has to be equal to 1 over square root vk squared plus mu squared. It, we cannot make up a new transformation to go from phi k to a k. We already defined the transformation in the previous section, right? Is that clear? But you have to be consistent. So you go from k to a dagger uh, using uh, the transformation from a few sections ago, what was it? it was, I think it was H, right? No. From F. Uh, and when you plug in that same transformation, then H int, I'm just going to plug it in um, without thinking too much. There's a lambda over 4 factorial. There's a quarter from the substitution. Sum over k1, k2, k3, k4. Then there's my delta function, which I'm still not using. And then for instead of phi k1, I have to write this uh, a dagger k1 plus a k1. And it's divided by the square root of omega k1. And that's phi k1. And then there's uh, the same thing for k2. And square root omega k2. And so on and so forth. One more for k3. And then one more for k4. Looks really messy. But up to simplifying, we're actually, we're actually now in, in the same space as, as the Klein Gordon Hamiltonian. So everything's expressed, expressed in terms of k space um, creation and annihilation operators. And I remind you that the eigenstates, right, in the perturbative treatment, you take the eigenstates of this part of the Hamiltonian and then take expectation values of this operator with the eigenstates of, of this Hamiltonian. The eigenstates are these Fox states, right? And if we now take uh, uh, matrix elements between Fox states, uh, so of, of H and with these Fox states, we know exactly how to do it because we know how these different uh, A's and A daggers act on these Fox states. Right? Increase and decrease the number by one and add coefficients, you know, square roots of n and stuff like that. So in theory, anything could be calculated. Give me, a, give me a certain state, and I know how to start calculating stuff here. I have to, it'll take me a long time, right? I'm actually going to do one of them right now. Uh, but we know how to do everything. So we can uh, evaluate any uh, matrix element, at least in theory. It's just a matter of, of time. 
Um, the one that we want to do is we want to um, start with the vacuum energy. Uh, and the vacuum energy is equal to zero. That's the way we've defined it. That's why we shifted our Hamiltonian. And we now want to find the first order contribution from perturbation theory to the vacuum energy. So uh, without perturbation, non-perturbed, E0 is equal to zero. And with the perturbation, then E0 will be zero plus the expectation value of H int uh, sandwiched by the, the vacuum state. So where all ends, where all ends in, in the Fox state are equal to zero. Now obviously when we do this with this H int, I mean there are a bunch of terms here, right? Uh, I don't want to calculate how many terms there are, but when you when you eventually do this, the only terms that will be important are the ones that have an equal number of creation and annihilation operations. Anything else, create three, destroy one, destroy three, and create one, whatever you want, to create four, that will always give you zero in this configuration. So you only want to keep the ones that have two uh, A's and two A daggers. So let's do that. I'm not going to keep terms which are kind of like A dagger squared A squared. Though, of course, different case, so it's a stupid notation. Um, but let's do this. So it's lambda over 4 factorial quarter sum over k1, k2, k3, k4. Delta k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4 square root omega k1, k2, omega k3, or, so that's the, uh, uh, the coefficient. And now let's start multiplying out. And as I said, I'm only going to keep the terms that will be non-zero when taking the vacuum expectation value. So this is multiplied, there are only six terms in total. There's an a dagger k1, a dagger k2, a k3, a k4, plus a dagger k1, uh, a k2, a dagger k3, a k4, dagger, I'm going to end, and three more. So I'm doing the simplest possible uh, expectation value, and this is really going to be very long, as you see. So think about how f much fun it is to evaluate higher order uh, perturbation theory uh, uh, corrections. And just, just to break the myth, no one actually goes through second, third, fourth order perturbation theory on paper. That's what Feynman diagrams were invented for. Okay, there's an easy way to do it, but we haven't learned it. So we're doing it the hard way. We're doing only the first term. And then if you ever learn Feynman diagrams, you're able to appreciate them because you see that if the first term is so complicated, right, the second order correction is 0, 0, but you have to sum in the middle sum over all other possible Fox states. So, right, and, and that only grows when you go to third and fourth order perturbation theory. So it gets very messy very quickly. So these are the six terms that will contribute in our case. Uh, and now we want to evaluate the vacuum expectation values. Um, and we can do this by using Wick's theorem. So say you want to use 
So say you want to evaluate the vacuum expectation value of the first term here. What will happen if you do Wick's theorem? So according to Wick, this is equal to all fully contracted terms, right? the sum over all fully contracted terms. options to fully contract them. Option number one, let me color code it instead of writing it seven times. One option is to take A dagger with A dagger and A and A. That gives... Why do we bother with that? It's already known. Correct. That's, I'm going to prove that in a second. I want to show you that even if you don't notice that, it'll work. But you're absolutely correct. So this is, what's this? Full contracted term? What's the contractor between A dagger and A dagger? Zero. Zero, right? It's just a commutator. It's the commutator of the. Uh, and then the second option, let's color code that in blue, uh, is you take this A dagger with this A and this A dagger with this A, but they both are already in normal order, as you pointed out, so there's also zero. And big surprise, the third option is to take. This and this, and this of course is also zero because it's also already in normal order. So in total, we just get zero. Very nice. Um, the same thing will happen for the second term. So, so one way of seeing it is, as, as Alex pointed out, this is already in normal order. So obviously, it's going to be zero, right? Uh, in this case, it's not in normal order, but it'll also always be zero because at least one of the contractors is always in normal order. See that? Are the three options? Another easy way of seeing it uh, is that the first operator acting on the vacuum state is an annihilation operator. That's also always zero. So it doesn't matter what's going to come here. So this is obviously going to contribute zero. This is obviously going to contribute zero. What about the third term? That was an A dagger acting on the vacuum. So you can't use the trick. So let's try weak. Is it zero or non-zero? Oh, that's getting complicated. We're only in a second. We have three more after that. Come on. <laughs> well, it's still zero. And the reason is that, if do again your, your blue, purple, and red contractors, it's either this A dagger with this A dagger, which is zero, this A dagger with this A, which is normal order, or this A dagger with this A, which is normal order. So one of the contracts is always in normal order, so a multiplication by zero is always zero. Right? So it's always going to be zero. Another way of seeing it, just look at the story. You're starting with a vacuum state, creating one particle, annihilating one particle, and annihilating another particle. Almost. What about this one? Well, that's easy. There's an A at the end, right? So that's zero. What about this one? No, non zero. Which one is the non zero term? There are three options to contract, right? That purple one. Very good. The purple one. Right? This thing will be non zero. You can create and annihilate the same particle and then create another particle. That's fine. And what about the last term? Now we have two contributions, right? Red and blue. Let me see. Red is fine. Yeah, I agree with red. So red is this, right? That is non-zero. And also blue is non-zero. Oh, I like this color coding. So out of the six terms, you take the sandwich. It looked that we now three times six terms because each of these gives you three terms in, in the Wick sum, in, in the fully contracted terms, but only three of them are non-zero. We, we didn't even have to write them because we're very intelligent physicists, right? But in the last term, we can Yeah. So say it starts with zero, you annihilate it twice, and then... No, you create. Dagger is creation. Yeah, okay. You, make, you upgrade it twice, you have zero, then you have two, and then you remove them again, so you once again have zero. 
which is perfect. And now you close it with a zero and you get whatever numbers came out of this. Yeah, but why the red and the blue are... Why are they different? No, you have three terms. Yeah. But if you look on the... So from the three terms, only the blue and the red survives. Yeah. You say that the purple will give you a zero. How do I know the purple is a zero? Here? No. I kind of contract this. Okay. I'm asking why the blue and the red. Well, let's try and look at the. Uh, so, in, in terms of Wick's theorem, we're going to write down the expressions in a second and you'll see why they're on zero. We actually use Wick's theorem to, to evaluate the number. Uh, but if you think about, about the story, which I think is even more intuitive, you're creating two particles and you're destroying two particles. No, you in state zero, number zero. Oh, okay. You're back into the state zero, but when you close, right? So I'm starting with the state zero and then... I'm right? Yeah. This is equal to one, yeah. not, not zero. Yeah. Right? Just because, okay? That, that's where the difficulty is. Okay, so now we can um, evaluate our terms. So we have uh, only three terms that we have to evaluate. Oh, we have color coded them. That's so cool. So we have term number purple, we have term blue, and term red. Oh, that's so awesome. I love my colors. Okay, uh, so let's evaluate them. So when I do the uh, um, expectation value of AK1, AK2 dagger, AK3, AK4, dagger, then this must be equal to the fully contracted term um, this one and this one and the contraction of two operators is equal to its commutator and the commutator between AK1 and AK2 dagger is delta K1, K2, right? And the same thing here. So this is equal to delta K1, K2, times delta K3, K4. See that? In the same way, the blue term will give us delta K1, K3. Sorry. And delta uh, K2, K4. And the red will give delta K1, K4, and delta K2, K3. So all possible combinations. OK, that's cool. I can now go back to this expression, the, the general equation for H int, and I can now write down its vacuum expectation value. And, and, I, and I've already done the operator part, and then there's this part which is independent of, of operators. Or actually, it's this thing here, and then I have all the contractions. So what is left? is lambda over 4 factorial 1 quarter sum over k1, k2, k3, and k4 square root of all the energies and a delta which is momentum conservation And then I have three terms. One of them is delta K1, K2, delta K3, delta K1, K3, delta K2, K4, plus delta K1, K4, delta K2, 
K2K3. That's getting super simple. I have a sum over four different Ks and three deltas in each expression. That's super trivial, right? It's too late for that joke now. <laughs> um, so, so let's do it step by step. I'm going to first use just the, the, the two deltas in the brackets because they're easier to use. But when you replace, for example, here K2 by K1, then you also have to switch it in, in this bigger delta. Right? So this is going to be lambda over 4 factorial 1 quarter sum over or three expressions. So here I'm going to sum over k1 and k3, and I'm left with delta. So now I'm going to have 2k1 plus 2k3, right? Because k4 is equal to k3 and k2 is equal to k1. And here I get omega uh, k1 omega k3. Then the second term. Uh, I keep k1 and k2, and I sum over k3 and k4, and you get delta um, 2k1 plus 2k2. And this is divided by omega k1 omega k2. Very nice. Plus sum over k1 and over k2. And now I have to replace k4 by k1. But it basically amounts to the same thing, because it's all additive. So it's 2k1 plus 2k2. Um, divided by omega k1, omega k2, and close brackets. So far, so good. Ooh, last page. Okay, we're almost done. And we have these weird looking deltas, but you know how to deal with weird looking deltas, right? This is just a delta of 2 k1 plus k2. And that is equal to one half delta of k1 plus k2. Remember this property? It was like next to Fourier transform back in second year. Yeah. Okay. So we use that in every single term. We get a one half outside. We re we do one more um, sum, uh, and we're left with only a single sum. Yes. I'm replacing k4 by k1. So here I get k1, here I get k1. I'm replacing k3 by k2. But then the first one should be k1. Uh, no, the first one is k1 and k3 then. Never mind, yes. Okay. I mean, if you want, I can remain this k3 if you want. Here this is k3. It's a dummy variable. Instead of replacing k3 by k2, I can replace k2 by k3. Right. But the same thing. That's what the other thing actually means. That's the same as the first. Is that okay with you? Okay. I'm happy we can agree. Okay, so this is uh, the coefficient. We're left with one sum. And then we have, uh, so there's a one half from each term, but then three times, so that's three halves. 1 over omega k squared. Right, they all look the same after you use the final uh, delta function, which is why I'm just renaming whatever k is left as, as k. And well, we know exactly what this is, because we know what omega k is. So this is lambda over 4 factorial 1 quarter sum over k. Put this together, 3 eighths sum over k, 1 over v squared k squared plus mu squared. So we're going to end this exercise here, but in theory, you can now actually evaluate an exact number. This is still a sum. You don't know exactly what this means. But 
first of all, it's, uh, um, it, it converges, right? It, like one over k squared, you know, this converges. So we're fine for the moment. Not always does this happen. Does this happen. If you go on to about the third or fourth or fourth order term, they start diverging, which is really interesting. Um, but it still works. In, like, just neglect them. And so if you take up to second order, it works with experiment. You take one more term in the theory, it explodes. But if you just don't take that exploding term, it works with experiment up to like the 16th digit after the zero. It works really well. It's really surprising. If you want, you can actually evaluate this value, this, uh, uh, this number. Uh, you have to replace the sum by an interval over k, introduce density of states, uh, and you could technically also evaluate exactly what this is equal to, but we're, we're not going to. But just so you know that this is possible, uh, we've done the QFT part of the, of the exercise. Okay, questions about this? All right. So, two more short questions, short term questions. A minus sign, you're right. Aha. Aha. Ah, no, but it's symmetric in K, right? Omega of K is some K squared. So, so minus K and plus K, omega K and omega minus K are equal to each other. Right? It's, it's symmetric in K. If this were a linear dispersion relation, then it wouldn't work. You're right. But because it's quadratic in K, the, the minus sign just goes away. Is, is that what you asked? Was that a question? Okay. So let me, uh, this is actually very uh, easy, easy, well, it should be an easy question. I already tried to stress it during in the Fourier transform of, of the previous question. Density operator. So you're given the density operator in position space. Um, this is now, say, a three-dimensional operator. Um, and it is equal to, I'm also going to include spin states. So this is equal to psi dagger sigma of r times psi sigma of r. So this is the number operator of particles in spin state sigma, either up or down. Or if you want to generalize it, it could be you know any, any spin, uh, spin phi particle. And at position r. So it measures the density of or the number of particles in a certain state sigma uh, at a certain position r, you sum over all possible spin states and you get all the particles that are at this position r. Right? So it is a local operator and it depends on r. It is different for different positions because the density, and it could be uniform, but in general it could be different for different places in, in space. And you are asked to find uh, the representation of this operator in k space, so rho of k, um, which is an operator, and if you want, you can even put here a little squiggly line to illustrate that it's the Fourier transform. Now, for those of you who are expecting that this will be something like a k sigma dagger a k sigma. Right, for those of you who are expecting something like this, sum over sigma. So please note that this is totally and absolutely wrong. And it is impossible. And you have known this since your second uh, lesson in QM1. Because here you're measuring R space. You're counting all the particles at a certain position R. If you want to know all your particles that are 
at a certain point in space, so we know exactly where they are, they're here, then where are they in K space? Everywhere. So it cannot be a local operating K space. This is just impossible. Okay? So even if you made a mistake on the way and you got this solution, you know, turn on, and it's not possible, right? This is simple uh, QM1. So, so this must be a non-local operator in K-space and the other way around as well. If you start from this operator, let's say you're interested in the number of particles with a certain momentum K and certain sigma, then where are they in space? Well, they're spread out all over space. You could have a particle with momentum K over here, another one with the same momentum over here. It's not local, right? They don't have to be in the same position space. So this is obviously not true. Now let's solve the question. To solve the question, we have to plug in, uh, as always, the Fourier transform, uh, 1 over L to the 3 halves e to the minus ikr. You could use a plus sign here. It doesn't really matter, as long as you're consistent with going back and forth. Uh, a k sigma. These are operators. So I'm now going to plug psi dagger and its complex or Zermitian conjugate into the sum. And now we get that rho of r is equal to sum over sigma. I have to use it twice, so I have two sums over k. I'll call one k and the other k prime. There's a a dagger k sigma and an a k prime sigma. And then e to the minus i k minus k prime dot r over l to the third. Now let's see if we learned something in the last hour. Is this a function of k or a function of r? We've learned something, very nice. How do we turn it to... Hmm? I said rho of r, yeah, but, but I, if I don't write this... It, oh yeah, seriously? Okay. There's something over k, right? So that, I think we've passed that stage in, in our life. Um, it's always good we're making steps forward. Um, so, so how do we so how do we go from this to this? How, how do we you know? This is, so we plugged it in, but it's still a function of R. So what do we have to do? So we have to still do a Fourier transform. We haven't really transformed the case space yet, right? So in order to transform the case space, well, you've known this for a few years now. You multiply by e to the uh, let's call it q, right? So it's e to the i q r. I think I'm using a minus sign in my notes. No, using a plus sign. E to the IQR, right, on both sides. And then you have to integrate over all space on both sides. So on, on the left-hand side, what you'll get is the integral D3R uh, rho of R E to the IQR um, that's it. And on the right hand, on, on, on the right hand side, you get sum over sigma, sum over k and k prime. A k sigma dagger, a k prime sigma, um, integral d three r over l to the third e to the minus i k minus k prime. Um, there's a plus q here, so it needs to be minus q in here. Is R. Listen here, by definition, right, this is a, let me ask it differently. This expression, is this a function of Q or a function of R? You're integrating over R. So it's obviously a function of Q, right? So this is now rho of Q. Right? It's an operator, you can put a tilde if you want to differentiate it from, from the previous one. And on, on the uh, uh, right hand side, you can now use this integral. After you integrate, the R disappears. This is now a delta function of k minus k prime minus q. 
In other words, instead of k prime, you can now write um, uh, k plus q, minus k plus q. How does this work? q minus k. Is that going to work out? Why are we writing k prime to be q minus q? So we have here a k and a k prime. No, sorry, it's k minus. Whatever works. I want to get. I want to. I want to uh, um, do the sum over k prime. When I do the sum over k prime, so this thing has no k prime. This thing has a k prime, and then there's a delta. So what I have to do is replace k prime with whatever makes this delta non-zero. Ah, oh, okay. So that's why. So we want the delta to be zero. Of course. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. So we're left with sum over sigma, sum over k. Um, a dagger k sigma a uh, k minus q and there we go, we're done. So, well, what we did, we didn't find rho of k, what we actually did is we found rho of q. That's just a, a variable, doesn't really matter. This is not a function of k because again, we're summing over k, k will disappear. It's actually quite simple. It's a function of q. And you see it depends on the difference between the, uh, the two momenta. And as you're summing over k, uh, you're going to sum over all of k space, which is exactly what you expect to find all the particles that are localized at a certain position. You're summing over all the k's. You're summing over all different positions. You're going over the entire k space to figure out which of the particles at the different momenta are currently at this position. Okay? It's really simple, I know. Okay, one more question for today. Uh, I'm going to solve half of the question, which I think is the more, like, maybe physically uh, important question, and then I leave the rest of the question to you, which is just um, kind of more math. Uh, it's going to be the question from this last homework. Uh, the, the, the BCS field integral um, question, the, the haber sotonovich So I'll do the haber sotonovich part for you, and then the second part where you have to integrate over eta, uh, I'll leave that to you. Because it's more mathematical and, and less, like it's quite straightforward actually. This is homework six, question five, uh, BCS with Field integration. You're given a BCS Hamiltonian in D dimensions. It's getting more and more complicated. We start with 1D, we have 3D, now we're in D dimensions. So this is the uh, non-interacting part. It's quadratic in C. It's the part that we know how to diagonalize. And then there's an interaction part, which is these uh, attractive interactions between um, electrons that gives rise to superconductivity. But unlike what we did back then when we did all the, the, the Bogliolo transformations, here we're actually fine staying in R space. We don't have to go to K space. So Hubbard Sotonovich is, uh, it works in K space as well, but it, also, it works just as well in R space. So there's no need to transform. Remember that the total Hamiltonian, as always, you're <laughs> integrating over R. It does not depend on position. It's the total energy, not the energy density. So what you want to do with this Hamiltonian, uh, I'm going to solve A and B for you. A uh, is to write the partition function. And in B, 
you want to uh, do what's called Haber-Sosanovich. I'll introduce you when we get there. OK, so how do we um, write a partition function? This is a very technical. Um, it's a very technical procedure. There is nothing intelligent about it. Uh, there are two things you have to do. Uh, first step, replace all of your creation and annihilation operators. Uh, in this case, they are fermions. So you have to replace them by Grassmann numbers. So all of the daggers are replaced by the, the bars of the Grassmann numbers at the sigma of r. And all of the um, annihilation operators are uh, have no bar, but of course they still depend on signals, a different Grassmann number for each spin state and a different Grassmann number for each position. Uh, there are uh, indices, and of course the indices remain also when you replace operators by numbers, a right? different number for different indices. Uh, so that's fine. Step number two is to plug the Hamiltonian into the partition function. And in general, the partition function, I remind you, but this should be somewhere in your notes so you can use it during the test, is the integral. I'm going to write it in general with this psi that we introduced, which could be either bosonic or fermionic. But in a moment, we'll make it fermionic. So it's the sum over all different configurations of these fields or of these Grassmann numbers um, times e to the power of minus the action, and the action uh, is always given by uh, the integral over imaginary time d tau psi bar d tau psi plus h, which is a function of psi and psi bar, and minus mu n psi and psi bar. All you have to do is take the Hamiltonian, this entire really weird looking thing, put it into here, uh, number operator is in terms of daggers, it's just C, dagger C, an integral of all, of all space, right, D, D, R, and there's a sigma, so there's a sum over sigma, right, you're counting all the particles. So put on a number operator and just sum over all space. That's as simple as it is. Uh, and this thing here, the, the, the psi bar d tau psi, um, this is a little stupid notation because what you mean here is the vector of all psi i's times the vector of all of these psi i's. So what you actually mean is um, uh, it also has an implicit integral in it. So it's also sum over sigma an integral over all of space times this combination uh, eta bar d tau um, eta. So it, it's, in, it's implicit in this notation. It's a little stupid notation, but here I, I claim that sigma, uh, that psi uh, is the vector that includes all psi i's. Right. So if you remember this notation from class, one to infinity if you want, or to capital N or whatever. Right, so it's a vector times a vector, but if you're using continuous variables, then a vector times a vector is an integral of the two functions. And that's it. That's all you have to know, because now you can plug it all in. You. And I'm now going to use psi equals eta because I'm using Grassmann variables. So the partition function z is equal to the integral or the sum over all possible configurations of the fields. Eta, eta bar. Also here, by eta I mean uh, in the same way here, right? Otherwise I'd have to write here 
integral over all different etas at all different r's. This is kind of like shorthand notation. Sometimes people use it sort of a little d, they use this capital D, or squiggly d to emphasize that they mean all configurations of the different, uh, of the fields. But that doesn't have to confuse you, that's just notation. There's an integral over d tau, that's in the action. There's an integral over all of space, because each term here comes with an integral over space. There's a DDR here, there's a DDR here, and there's one in the Hamiltonian. And there's also a sum over all sigmas, which I forgot in my notes. So there's also a sum over sigma, because they also all come with a sum over sigma. So that's not true, the interaction term does not. It is step by step. That's why I forgot it. Um, so uh, where are we? So, so there are, uh, first of all, the non-interacting part, which is eta sigma bar. No, so here in the sum over sigma. Oy, oy, oy. Open brackets, sum over sigma, eta sigma bar. Here we go. Uh, and now we have all of the parts of the d tau. Uh, and then the quadratic parts from the Hamiltonian is the kinetic term and the chemical potential and well actually this is the chemical potential. Why don't I have this in here? Weren't I using mu? Ah, oh, this is mu. This is mu. Okay, it's already in the Hamiltonian. Forget about this term. We already have it in the Hamiltonian. That makes it easy. Eta sigma. It shouldn't be in the Hamiltonian, because the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on chemical potential. This would be without mu here. I guess, I mean, you could effectively put it in from the beginning. Okay, cool. Uh, so that, that's our mu. And then we finish the sum. And now the next part is without the sum, but it's still inside the time and the space integral. Uh, and that's the interaction term g. And again, we've replaced all the c's by etas, so we now have uh, eta bar up, eta bar down, eta down, and eta up. And all of these terms, uh, all of these etas depend on r and on tau. I'm just not writing explicitly. But obviously they do because you're integrating over these variables. Okay, so that's a. We've written down the partition function. And, and the point, and now we have to do haber sotonovich and, and the point uh, of haber sotonovich is the following. Whatever is written, so, so this up here, whatever is up here is the action, right? And you can do all sorts of games with this partition function and mess around with it, whatever you want. As, as long as you, you do mathematically, and of course you have to apply laws of mathematics, but as long as you don't do anything illegal, whatever is up here is the action. And if you know the action, you know the Lagrangian. If you know the Lagrangian, you know the Hamiltonian. If you know the Hamiltonian, you know the spectrum. At least if it's not interacting, and if not, then you can do whatever you want to do to make, to do that, to, I don't know, some kind of approximation. But the point is that the action tells you everything. It's just a matter of putting it into the machine and, and twisting the handle, right? Uh, so maybe we can make this Stuff up here look easier mathematically, but it still entails the same physics. And that's the idea of haber sotonovich You introduce some kind of different field, which is just a mathematical thing for the moment. There's no physical meaning. It can have physical meaning, but for the moment, it's just a mathematical trick. Uh, and what you can show, and this is what you're asked to do in, in B, is that the interaction part, so let's call this Z interaction, just the interaction part of Z, um, which is the integral over eta bar eta e to the minus, or actually plus because there are two minus signs, uh, integral 0 to beta d tau integral d dr in g, and then we have eta bar up, eta bar down, eta down, eta up. So this thing is the interaction part. Um, and, and I want to show 
Actually, I should write it without the integral, probably, because I cannot really take this to the end. So let's write it without this. It's just the exponent. Um, and I can show that this is equivalent to the integral over this auxiliary field, this newly introduced field, which has no meaning whatsoever. At least not that at this point you shouldn't be concerned about the meaning of it. You want to show that this is the same, right? You want to show that this is equal. So, so one way of doing this, and it's a really stupid way of doing it, is to start from here, try adding deltas and stuff up here, and, and then try and get from here to here. That's never going to work. Maybe it will, but it'll take you a very long time. The easiest way is to go back. I, what's called reverse engineering. So you, you've already been told uh, that you've been told this is true. All you have to do is prove it. Uh, and in general, what you could have done, say this wasn't given, not in tests, but I mean like in, in, in like real life problems. Um, after a while, you'll figure out that it's this kind of uh, so with a, with a Gaussian and then linear terms. So it's this kind of transformation that makes it work, and you could just use you know general constants here and here, and then reverse engineer, and then figure out what your constants have to be so that it works. Right? So you can always you can always do that. Uh, and in order, so all we have to do now is compute the integral over delta, and when we compute the integral over delta, we have to make sure that we get this. So in order to compute the integral over delta, and the important point is. Uh, that delta is a bosonic field. Albert Sotonovich always uses a bosonic field. Bosons are always easier than fermions, as you've already felt on, uh, on your flesh. So it's a bosonic field. Uh, it's a coherent state number, so you can use all the tricks that we have. And in general, it's also complex. So you cannot, you cannot really assume that it's real. It could be real in certain cases, but in general, I wouldn't assume anything about that at the moment. So it's a complex bosonic field, uh, and it's a coherent state number. So you can now go ahead and uh, do Gaussian integration for complex numbers. So I remind you of one of the formulas that you uh, explored many, many weeks ago. The integral over e to the minus v dagger a v plus u dagger v plus v dagger w. This is equal to pi to the n over the determinant of a times e to the u dagger inverse of a times w. I copy this from the homework sheet. So I guess you can do it as well. No one expects you to know this kind of stuff with my heart. That's what open notes are meant for. Okay, so now we can just apply this formula to our case here. And remember that, uh, as we've spoken already many times, vector multiplication is a sum over the elements of the vector, which in the continuous case is an integral over all the indices. The indices are tau and r. I can directly apply this formula. All I have to do is figure out what is what. So A, what is A in this formula? 1 over G, right? So for the solution, I'm going to need A to the minus 1, the inverse of, of A, which is equal to? Well, that's really st stupid. I could do that in kindergarten. Um, what else do I have to figure out? Who is V? And who is V dagger? V is the thing that multiplies A. 
We said that A is 1 over G, so what multiplies 1 over G? Oh, so the right, there's a delta and a delta star, right? One, one of, which either you want, you can, you know, it's degenerate. And if this is V, then what is U? Right, there's a term here, U dagger V. So what multiplies V in the linear term? Right, so U dagger is eta bar up, eta bar down. Right, because u dagger v is this term. And then the second term here, v dagger w, so v dagger is, at a, is delta star at this one, or delta bar, whatever you want. Uh, and then, and then uh, w is this combination of etas. So w is equal to eta up, sorry, eta down, eta up. And now we're technically done. Now we always have to plug in what we figured out. So that interaction. Z interaction is equal to well, there's some constant, right? Pi to the n over the terminal a. Who cares about the constant? It's probably going to be something infinite, but who cares about it? So it's, there's some constant which is irrelevant. And the reason it's irrelevant is, like I said, all we care about is whatever is in the power of the, of the exponent, because whatever is up here, that's the action. We don't care about what's before the exponent. We only care about the action. When we have the action, then we can do Grungian, Hamiltonian, and so on and so forth. Right? So there's some irrelevant constant. And now we need to write e to the power u dagger. So u dagger is eta bar up times eta bar down. And now we need to multiply by the inverse of a, which is g. And then we need to multiply by w, which is eta down it up. Okay, I'll apply the formula. Let's check. Why oh, is there no integral? Because I'm not integrating. Oh, boy. I have to integrate because it's a, it's a, it's a vector multiplication, right? It's a sum, it's a vector, it's an integral. So there's an integral d tau and an integral d dr. There we go. Is it the same? We're done, right? You see it? You don't see it? You lost it? And from here on, I think the exercise now asks to uh, compute the sum of eta, right? The point is that after you've done this, your action is now, sorry, your action is now, uh, so this part here, now went away and it's replaced by all of this, which, which looks much longer and much more uh, icky and you don't really want to do anything with it. But the point is that now eta only appears quadratically. And now you can integrate over eta. So in the end, you will get an action that does not depend on eta at all. It depends only on delta, but it still entails the same, it still entails the same physics because all you've done is mathematical tricks. So now the zonic field that describes the same physics like the uh, um, um, I lost my thread as a fermionic field, uh, and you might be able to diagonalize that. So you couldn't diagonalize this. You may be able to diagonalize uh, your delta field. How to relate delta back to eta and see it in an experiment, and what does it mean? Very good question. Not for this course. For this course, it's all it's all about how to use it, right? And when you know how to use it, then you can do advanced solid state physics, something like that, and, and you'll see how this is used uh, in different ways. But for now, this is all we want to learn. So this is clear. This is very central for the test. This appears on almost every test for the past two years. So I recommend really going over this step by step and understanding each step properly. Questions? Okay, so good luck in the test. I'll see you there.